I was going to call this lecture The Promise and Peril of Permaculture for two reasons that I subsequently abandoned. The first was because it sounded deliciously alliterative, all those popping peas in sequence. It rolled off the tongue real nice, or, or rather off the lips, in a Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers kind of way. And the second reason was because we're taught to think in a binary fashion since grade school, schooled in heroes and villains and good guys and bad guys, right answers and wrong answers, yes or no responses, taught to compare and contrast two opposing values, taught to calculate cost-benefit ratios, and a naive read of nexus thinking cautions us to believe that everything positive has to come with some negative, that the peculiar properties of this particular universe preclude a Panglossian perspective on problem solving, and that it would be Pollyannaish to presume that the platitudes of permaculture, with their plethora of polycultural prognostications, held only positive promises for praxis and progress when practiced by the human population. That's a lot of peas. <laughs> there must be some peril, right? Some downside to the permanent culture notion, to this idea that basing civilization on the permanent polycropping perennial agriculture associated primarily with polytheistic primitive pagan peoples, instead of the annual monocropping regime based on monotheistic monarchies, who have historically pursued and made money through monopolies and the worship of mammon, would somehow right the wrongs of previous millennia. Could it really be so simple? What's the catch? Aye, and therein lies the rub. And the reason why I've abandoned calling this lecture the promise and peril of permaculture. Supposing there are no perils. Are there no exceptions to rules? Just because almost everything else we've done has had a downside, supposing this one doesn't, how could that be? Well, it's definitional. Like the word sustainable, the presence of the term permanent in permaculture, coupled with the value being sustained permanently, human nature, polyculture, implies an indisputably positive outcome. The thesis is something life-affirming, durable, self-sustaining, and therefore permanent. A permanent presence of the human and natural systems that support each other to continue the co-evolution of life on this planet. The antithesis, the antithesis, would be extinction. In traditional Hegelian dialectics, the tension would be resolved through the compromise of synthesis. Permaculture would be set against extinction, and through the wrestling of these two polarities, would emerge the uneasy, unholy alliance we see today. A culture in which progress occurs in fits and starts, and many ideas involve two steps forward, one step backwards, while others offer only one step forward and two steps backward, sucking us down the slippery slope into the abyss of the low-level equilibrium trap. We anguish over our advances, believing that the law of unintended consequences will always turn around and bite us in the behind. Ow. We see our progress as being a series of hopeful missteps. With the best of intentions, we say we invented, for example, cars to free us from the lugubrious loping of horses and the stench of their manure. Ugh. And for some who cared about animal rights, to free horses from their slavery. This was particularly true when our cities grew in size. Reports of the problems of dealing with so much animal waste make New York, or made New York, of the 19th century truly seem like Hell's Kitchen. People were said to wallow knee-deep in filth, stepping to the curb, and nobody could enter a ball without their gown being smeared with filly feces. Never mind that even today in Sumatra, I was able to visit a city filled with delightful horse-drawn carriages where there was no smell, no flies, and no filth in the streets. The horses there essentially wore diapers, manure-collecting bags that were attached just beneath their butts. The Indonesians consider animal manure something much too valuable to throw away, and human beings are far too clever to simply let it fall in the street to be trampled and then have to invest time and labor to scoop it back up. This is classic permaculture solutions. And it is hard, that's bad. This is a classic permaculture solution, and it's hard to see a downside. The same solution is employed to the collection of fruit from trees by the road. 
In many cities in the world, particularly here in the U.S., food-giving trees are forbidden to be planted in cities, especially on public thoroughfares. The ordinances usually cite the danger to pedestrians of fruit fall creating slippery conditions and the hassle to street cleaners, the potential to attract bugs and vermin, the possible smells if fruit rots. But in some cities in the tropics, they simply hang nets around the trees like diapers so that the, that, so that the fruit never touches the ground and they get a great harvest with no hassle. I often wondered why people in so many places spend hours scavenging on the ground for the few good fruit that they've come, that have, they've come down from the tree, the majority already infested with grubs and worms, bruised from the fall, when a simple cloth under the tree would increase yields, the harvest yields, by like 90%. I suspect that the real reason we use useless ornamentals in our cities instead of fruit trees, as I saw being done in Utsunomiya, Japan, where kiwi fruit trellis over parking garages and walnut and apple trees line the boulevards and even front lawns contain blades of rice grass, blades of rice, instead of Kentucky bluegrass. And I, really think, I, think, I think that the real reason is to keep people from having free food so we can keep market capitalism going. There was a claim made by some planners that the homeless would fight over free food if it simply fell from trees and that we need to forbid it to keep social order. But I, I've never observed this in practice. In places like Merida, Mexico, where breadnut trees dominate the major avenues, I was able to talk to homeless people about eating the breadnut that fell from the trees. They weren't fighting. Or, or the intentional food forests of Oakland or, or L.A. Um, People have, people have a way of working these things out. It seems more plausible. The social order being preserved is the one of the haves versus the have-nots. Permaculture would never allow space to be made useless in this way. Permaculture principles would say, you got space, you got sunlight, great, grow food. And permaculture principles would never have permitted the car to become such a problem. We're told that we solved the problem of horse-drawn buggies by inventing the horseless carriage, aka the car, the automobile or self-driving moving thing, and then we say, oops, it solved one problem, but it created another. Air pollution and water pollution, toxic emissions of chemicals that cause lung disease and cancer and smog and global warming, to say nothing of wars for foreign oil. And yet, a permaculturalist would say, what does all that have to do with the horseless carriage? The entire problem could have been neatly sidestepped if we just followed through on the early work of Ford and Edison, who started the automobile era, and they started it off with biofuel-powered cars and electric cars. They even started their own Ford Edison electric car company, and both had a dream that farms would power our economy through wastes, a very permacultural solution indeed. Some authors have even suggested that if we were driving hydrogen cars, the more cars there were on the road, the cleaner the air would become. Car as solution provider rather than problem. So it wasn't the cars. It was the way that we powered the cars. Permaculture is systems thinking. And every permaculture site is an ipso facto on the ground nexus. Permaculture has several really important starting points that make it work. One is the idea of concentric circles of useful activity. For most human beings, the center of that circle is you, your body. If you're really nearsighted, as I am, permaculture prudence suggests you place your glasses within arm's reach by your bedside at night and not out by the trampoline in the backyard. I foolishly left mine in the bathroom one night in Beverly Hills when we were awakened by the 1994 earthquake, and the falling bookcases and broken glass made it impossible for me to get into the bathroom to get my glasses. I had to stumble out of the apartment half naked in the dark and make my way down the street amidst the aftershocks to try and find my car where I had a box of contact lenses in the glove compartment. And then I had to figure out how to put them on by flashlight. Thank God I had a flashlight. Smart Californians, whether they've studied permaculture or not, tend to wisely keep an earthquake preparedness kit in the house within easy reach with a flashlight and extra batteries. Permaculture takes these common sense ideas ever outward, 
from your body to your bedroom to your kitchen and living room and out to the kitchen garden. It stresses to invest first and foremost in designs that minimize later labor, that don't waste effort. You place things where you are most likely to use them with the greatest frequency and in ways that minimize the inputs and maximize the use of the outputs. That's permaculture systems thinking. In Palestine last year, my students and I and Anas visited a new eco-village farm in the process of studying permaculture that a couple of years previously had ignored the concentric circle principle when they installed their first home-scale biogas system. They had built it by the road in the lemon grove where visitors entered the farm and set up a little tea cooking station with an attractive sign. It was great. The only problem was that it was a hassle to carry the food waste from the kitchen, which was like a three to four minute walk away, out to the digester, and nobody really wanted to walk out there to have a cup of tea either. They hadn't seen it as an integral part of the kitchen-based food energy water nexus, so it sat unused for two years until we got there, emptied it out, dragged it through the agroforestry groves, and refilled it next to the kitchen. And now it's being used every day, and it's working great. You could say that the decision to place it at the entrance of the farm was irrational, but it stemmed from two completely logical but flawed assumptions. The first was that it might smell, uh, smell bad and spoil the kitchen experience. And after all, who knew that you could take all that rotten food waste and put it in a tank filled with water and manure and create something that actually created solutions besides eliminating problems rather than creating new problems? Who, who knew? So lack of experience is one reason keeping your waste next to you didn't seem to compute for human beings. The other was that a cool innovation needed to stand on its own as a kind of museum piece made a nice story, having guests to the farm encounter the miracle technology right as they entered, saying to people, here we are in a fruit tree grove, and did you know that the waste from those trees can be put to use to grow more trees? Nice idea, but deeper nexus thinking, systems thinking, permaculture thinking, would have led to the conclusion that the very best place for the digester would have been right where the waste is being generated and right where the fuel is being used. Now you could say, but what are the fertilizer? Isn't that supposed to go back out to the fruit tree garden? Well, yeah. Yes and no. As the Germans say, jein. Ja und nein. Jein. In permaculture, you need the most fertilizer right next to the kitchen, because that's where you eat the most food. Think about it. Food is energy, and it takes energy to go out to the orchard. So you're expending energy when you go to harvest your food, which means you're losing part of the energy that you grew the food in the first place to get. In permaculture, you try to grow the food you eat that is consumed on a daily basis and that grows on a daily or weekly basis as close to the kitchen as possible. This is what all animals do in behavioral ecology. They, they optimize solutions. They're lazy. Laziness is good. You have the right to be lazy. Hence the need for windowsill herbs in the kitchen and porch-based container gardens and hanging planters and kitchen gardens and herb spirals right outside to say nothing of growing as much food indoors as possible using vertical farming. Of course, this seems difficult to even conceive when your floor plan has been designed to maximize your consumption and the waste you produce so you can keep corporations and municipal tax collectors flush with cash. The difficulties are hyper-compounded when you live in a society that's designed around cars and built and a society that built suburbs so far away from grocery stores and farmers markets and places of work and worship that you could literally starve and die from loneliness if your car broke down and you couldn't reach anybody to help. The suburbs are a permaculture thinker's nightmare. In permaculture, the chief objective is to do as much design as you can up front. You invest everything you can in creating a system that saves labor and energy and materials in the long run. You design smart. You put in time today so you don't waste time tomorrow. However, since most of us don't have an awful lot of capital to put into creating our perfect permacultural landscape, permaculture also recognizes the value of social and cultural capital and encourages communitarian values. That's why people see it as a hippie thing. The proponents of permaculture recognize the fungibility of all the different forms of capital and how to shuttle value between them. One day you're rich in financial capital. The next day you may have traded it for more natural capital. You grew more trees. Or more intellectual capital. You read more books. You had a conversation. Or, or even the capital that's been accumulating in your garbage can. 
That's capital too. Permaculture holistically recognizes the otherwise hidden values in all things. If there's a peril to permaculture, well, you know what it is. Permaculture imperils the unsustainable status quo, right? Permaculture reduces what economists call the deadweight losses of society. That area under the supply-demand curve where inefficiencies tend to pool like cesspool water from leaky pipes. As defined by our friend Wikipedia, in economics, a deadweight loss, also known as excess burden or allocative inefficiency, is a loss of economic efficiency that can occur when equilibrium for a good or service is not achieved or is not achievable. End quote. Some would have you believe that equilibrium is not achievable. Others don't want it to be achievable. Pareto optimality, that hypothetical state of equilibrium in which nobody loses, but most importantly, nobody gains, at least not at the expense of anybody or ever, anything else. To quote Wikipedia again in that horrendous British accent, Pareto efficiency or Pareto optimality is a state of allocation of resources further from which it is impossible to make any one individual better off without making at least one individual worse off. And what's wrong with that, you may ask? Well, from an idealized perspective, from the point of view of a permaculturally-minded utopian, nothing at all. But for those who have profited tremendously from the externalization of human health, social, and environmental costs, for those for whom a system of unaccounted for negative externalities and marginal benefits from dead weight loss recovery has resulted in incredible wealth, there is tremendous peril here. In the zero-sum game thinking that drives inefficiency, the idea that nobody can get any richer without somebody else getting poorer has led to incredible mental gymnastics of justification for debilitating poverty and suffering. And if you tell people that they aren't allowed to get richer at somebody else's expense, they're likely to get very upset. Wars have been fought over the idea that we might use policy to achieve Pareto optimality and eliminate all the inefficiencies in the system. It would create what Nobel Prize winning economist Herman Daly called a steady state economy, which would be a wonderful thing from an ecological point of view, but tends to drive capitalists mad. People who grew up in what economist Kenneth Boulding, who was also nominated for a Nobel Prize, I assume these guys know what they're talking about, called the cowboy economy of endless expansion and growth, often can't wrap their minds around what he described as the inevitable spaceman economy that was needed to save us from extinction. A spaceman economy being that economy that you would live in on a spaceship where, like the Earth, all you had was sunlight coming in and nothing could leave, no wastes could go out. So what is the peril of permaculture? Precisely that it leads to a paradigm shift in which the steady state economy of daily or the spaceman economy of Boulding is taken seriously and put into practice. Permaculture creates steady state solutions that would work on a spaceship and would certainly then heal the planet that Buckminster Fuller called Spaceship Earth. What then is the promise of permaculture? Permaculture is a systems thinking approach that only differs from the usual nexus thinking and systems thinking models we discuss in academia in that it truly evolved from the ground up and mostly by people who are fed up with the all talk no action problems that plagued many institutions and who simply took matters in their own hands to solve their own problems. The father of the permaculture movement, Bill Mollison, who defined the term and started this particular form of systems thinking was a self-proclaimed iconoclast who started life as an Australian crocodile Dundee of sorts, leaving the family bakery to work as a professional shark fisherman, logger, mill worker, trapper, snake snarer, tractor driver, and naturalist. When as a 26-year-old, working for the Wildlife Survey Section in the rainforest of Tasmania in 1954, and with inland fisheries, he discovered his passion for the way that natural ecologies work without waste and observe the way that trees and their root systems link together and knit together the tapestry of biology. And he decided, he decided to start his own homestead where he could put what he discovered and what he was discovering about nature into practice in his own life. He said, after many years as a scientist, no, he said, 
After many years as a scientist, I began to protest against the political and industrial systems I saw were killing us and the world around us. But I soon decided that it was no good persisting with opposition that in the end achieved nothing. I withdrew from society for two years. I did not want to oppose anything ever again and waste time. No protests for this guy. I wanted to come back only with something very positive, something that would allow us all to exist without the wholesale collapse of biological systems. His experiments led him into teaching at the University of Tasmania, where in 1974, he and a student of his, David Holmgren, quote, jointly evolved a framework for a sustainable agricultural system based on a multi-crop of perennial trees, shrubs, herbs, vegetables, and weeds. Yes, weeds. Fungi and root systems, end quote, for which they coined the word permaculture. The design approach that was first made public when their book, Permaculture One, A Perennial Agriculture for Human Settlements, appeared in 1978. Wikipedia tells us, soon after permaculture was first introduced and then put into practice by the public, Mollison recognized that permaculture principles encompassed a movement that included not only agriculture, horticulture, architecture, and ecology, but also economic systems, land access strategies, and legal systems for businesses and communities. So you see, permaculture is a nexus of nexuses. Where's the word nexi? A systems connection between systems. Mollison wrote in Introduction to Permaculture, 2011, As I saw permaculture in the 1970s, it was a beneficial assembly of plants and animals in relation to human settlements, mostly aimed towards household and community self-reliance, and perhaps as a commercial endeavor only arising from a surplus from that system. However, permaculture has come to mean more than just food sufficiency in the household. Self-reliance in food is meaningless unless people have access to land, information, and financial resources. So in recent years, it has come to encompass appropriate legal and financial strategies, including strategies for land access, business structures, and regional self-financing. This way, it is a whole human system. Get that? A whole human system. Permaculture became popular because it continues to evolve as permaculture thinkers continue to figure out how to put Humpty Dumpty back together again, as they develop methodologies for making sure it encompasses every part of the elephant we blind mortals dance around. You may recall in our first lectures we looked at a paper that criticized the few nexus because it left out livelihoods. Remember that? and ignored the bottom-up approach. We tried to improve Nexus thinking by bringing this ground-level, grassroots perspective in. Permaculture started at the ground level, so it was never left out. But lest you were given the impression that permaculture is entirely the domain of the folks with calloused hands and sunburns who never sought a college degree, this brief history of the movement shows that it got its public genesis as a university interaction between Professor Mollison and his students. The fact that so few colleges and universities even mention permaculture in a course, much less teach it, or God forbid, issue the famous PDC Permaculture Design Certificate, says volumes about how the establishment continues to marginalize real solutions. Perhaps they see the peril of permaculture. So while I don't see any peril in permaculture, while I only see promise, I acknowledge that there are plenty of people who would not be happy if all of us took the permaculture approach. And I suggest that this is one key reason we don't teach it as we should, if at all. There is a false dialectic being portrayed any time we take something that is holistic and healing and try to find parts to place in opposition as though there were possible contrary positions. Imagine going to the doctor with cancer and she says, well, we're going to take a whole systems approach to curing you. We'll explore nutrition and diet and exercise and laughter and stress relief and medication and meditation along with radiation and chemotherapy and surgery and prayer and blue mind time spent by the ocean. And we'll look at pain relievers from acupuncture to aspirin to homeopathic medicine to morphine. We call the approach total wellness therapy. And imagine you said, What's the catch? I mean, isn't there a downside to this? 
I mean, what if I want to die from cancer painfully? The promise of a holistic systems thinking approach is that it puts everything in the nexus. And when you put everything in the nexus, then we can work out the right mix through experimentation and improve the odds of fixing any given problem by increasing the variety and sophistication and range of tools available to us. If we see a holistic solution approach as one side of a debate, as a thesis that demands an antithesis to counter it and creates a tension that can only be resolved through some form of compromise, we end up with either a tepid synthesis that leads to more inefficiencies dead weight losses, and negative externalities, or to stagnation, or worse, to political conflict and warfare. Permaculture and systems thinking and nexus thinking aren't just an approach. They are the approach. They encompass all other approaches and weigh them against the standards of life, liberty, and the pursuit of justice and happiness. They embrace top-down and bottom-up and everything in between, from livelihoods to institutions. They embrace the three pillars of sustainability, economic, social, and environmental. The only possible alternative is extinction, for that's the opposite of sustainability. Right? You catch my drift? Nobody who's, who believes in life without suffering can take a position against permaculture. Permaculture is the ultimate goal of all societies, at least those that want to last. So your task, your task to start or continue in your study is to study permaculture until it becomes a permanent part of you. And your assignment? We challenge you to come up with a permaculture design plan for your house or neighborhood or study area or workplace. If it makes sense, you will have done it right. That's how we know permaculture works. It works when it works. That's the promise of permaculture. There is no peril.